Pike Symposium at Prohibition Partners Live. Hello and welcome to the Psych Virtual Stage at Prohibition Partners Live. The topic of this panel is the importance of data, tech and community in psychedelics. My name is Dave King. I'm the moderator for today's session and a senior researcher at the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, a UK-based policy analysis unit established to communicate drug research to politicians on the centre-right and encourage the development of evidence-based drug control strategies that are scientifically, economically, medically and ethically legitimate. We are currently spearheading a, spearheading a campaign to reschedule psilocybin for the benefit of clinical research. I'm also a final year medical student at King's College London and the co-founder of Breaking Convention, a UK charity that has run Europe's largest academic conference on psychedelic research since 2011. Joining me on the panel today are Julie Armstrong, the CEO of Aurelius Data, Sanjay Singhal, the founder of the Nikean Foundation, and David Champion, the CEO of Maya Health. These panelists have tremendous experience and expertise between them, spanning a wide range of sectors, and are superbly placed to offer their insights to today's session on data, tech, and community. Before we dive into the discussion, I'd like to spend a few minutes to briefly introduce each speaker in turn and invite them to share a quick overview of their current work and the unique perspective that they will each be bringing to the panel. Firstly, Julie Armstrong is the founder and CEO of Aurelius Data. She was formerly an elected council older woman for the city of Missoula and an appointed state of Montana ambassador. Having founded several companies, Julie is a, is a successful entrepreneur with a reputation for innovation and problem solving. She is also a pharmacist, a cancer survivor, and has degrees in pharmacy, advertising, marketing, and a master's in sports science. Julie, you're pioneering the use of deep learning methods to analyze data on the consumer use of plant medicines. It's really great to have you here with us today. Thank you. We, uh, we know in the United States that we have a long culture of, um, of patients really adopting and wanting to use plant medicines. We know that there's not an absence of data. We know there's just an absence of normalized data. So our goal has been able to uh, want to amalgamate all the data that's in these community acquired protocols that we know work and apply um, machine learning to those to find the patterns that we feel are the most beneficial treatments and be able to get that data to the folks that are wanting to uh, affect change and legalize these medications. I feel like the potential for or quality of life and fewer side effects is an ethical dilemma that we aim to solve. And we think that plant medicine is um, it's probably at the forefront of creating equity in medicine. So it, it's it's something we've been very interested in. And we, we're looking, of course, at psilocybin, MDMA, ayahuasca, LSD, and, of course, cannabis and, as solutions to a lot of the mental health issues in America. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Julie. It's a, a real pleasure to have you on board. Our second panelist is Sanjay Singhal, a Canadian author, tech entrepreneur, and the founder of audiobooks.com. He has recently launched the Nikayan Foundation, which funds psychedelic research in Canada, the UK, and the US. He is president of the Aquanta Group, the managing partner for 500 Startups Canada, an angel investor, and an active philanthropist. Among the projects that Sanjay currently supports is Field Trip Health, a Canadian clinic providing ketamine-assisted psychotherapies. Sanjay, you're supporting the development of psychedelic medicines through both research trials and clinical practice. Uh, please, can you give us a, a quick introduction to your work and how you see this area develop? Sure, uh, David, thank you. <clears throat> so. I founded Nikayan Foundation um, a year ago uh, based off of my daughter's struggles with anorexia and some early evidence from Robin Carhart Harris's work at Imperial University that uh, 
psilocybin might be a potential treatment for anorexia. Uh, and while doing the research for investing in um, an imperial, discovered that these psychedelic medicines, all the ones that Julie just mentioned, are actually uh, potentially useful for a wide variety of mental disorder uh, conditions. And so decided that creating a foundation and creating a professional structure for investing in these companies was going to be, uh, or investing in these efforts, was going to be beneficial for, for the world at large. Uh, but I discovered very early on in this effort that the various research teams weren't really sharing data. And one of the opportunities that Nikayan had was to, to funding, for example, we're funding a, a MAPS anorexia trial with M MDMA as well as Imperial's uh, anorexia trials with psilocybin. Uh, there, that there was an opportunity to have the researchers work to, with each other because as a charitable foundation, we're not particularly... Can, we're doing the research to use software that's either compatible with other software or to create data fields that allow for, um, for comparison of, of outcome measures um, in a way that the researchers wouldn't necessarily be, be incented to do if, uh, if a funder wasn't the one uh, 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 pushing it. And, and now, you know, with, with projects like what David's working on, we're going to find out in a second, Julie's, uh, on the data collection side and the, the software side, it's making it possible to collect this data for the first time um, in, a, in a centralized way. Really looking forward to, to what, can, what we can do there. Amazing. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Um, I agree enormously, and particularly eating disorders is, a, is an area where we desperately need new interventions. The unmet clinical burden there is vast. Uh, and the, the outcomes are often quite terrible. Um, David, uh, moving on to you, our final panelist. David is the co-founder and the CEO of Maya Health, the co-founder and director of Unlimited Sciences, and formerly a co-founder and chief product officer at Baker Technologies. In 2019, he served as a campaign lead in the Denver Psilocybin Initiative, helping Denver become the first U.S. city to reform psilocybin policy. Prior to that, David was a Cambridge-educated architect who ran a non-profit to help Kenyan, Kenyan children access schooling. David, you have uh, developed a platform for providers of plant medicine services to organize sessions and collect safety and outcome data. Please could you give us a brief introduction to your work and the insights that you can, you can bring to today's session. Thanks, Dave. Happy to. The way I see this is that practitioners of psychedelic medicine are really the, the holders of the keys to the success of this entire space. And if we can empower them with the tools that they need to offer the best quality of care, to develop that layer of trust with their clients and patients in this space, then we have a chance of creating a bedrock of evidence that psychedelic treatments can work for a range of mental health conditions, for psychological and spiritual growth. And I think there's an opportunity to recognize that there have been many, many pioneers in this space for decades. We're not starting fresh with a sort of brand new climate for psychedelic medicine starting from ketamine. We have a rich history of ways that these practices have been offered. And while a lot of the focus is on whether a compound can work, quote unquote, the sort of second part of the equation is how do we create the right containers, what's often called set and setting, the right environment and the right mindset for a patient to, make, to gain the best health outcomes from these types of treatments. And so everything we do with Maya is meant to empower the psychedelic practitioners to be able to understand themselves whether the care they're offering is really optimized. And we hope that this is leading us to a form of personalized even preventative psychedelic mental health care. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. I think that that point that you made about um, how this new wave of research, uh, this isn't the, the, the first time there's been interest in these areas, and, and we, we certainly aren't the first uh, sector to, to have an interest. I think that's something that we'll come on to a little bit later in the discussion when we 
move on to a, uh, a discussion about community um, and how to uh, bring in the, the, the vast amount of data and experience uh, and insight that um, different groups have around the world and, and uh, how we can ensure that they play a role uh, that, that benefits them as well in the future of, uh, in, in the future of, of the field. Um, so moving on to the discussion, um, it's a discussion of two parts broadly. The first on data and technology, looking at the role of big data, uh, new advances in study designs um, and so forth, and then moving on to, to issues of community, uh, exploring issues of access, representation, stigma, business ethics and corporate social responsibility. So starting with data and technology, um, I'd like to first of all invite Sanjay uh, to comment on, on the following. Thinking about the centralization of data banks for big data analyses, to what extent will the future success of psychedelics rely on an open science approach where researchers, ado researchers adopt a transparent approach uh, to sharing data with other researchers in an atmosphere of collaboration over, co um, over competition? Um, thanks for the question, uh, David. I think, you know, early on I had the naive hope that we were going to be able to uh, cooperate and have open science for all of the research programs that were going on, and that was quickly dashed. I think there's a lot of rush of commercial interests in this space that all want to develop IP-protected uh, uh, data for a treatment of, of disorders with psychedelics. Uh, but what we can do is encourage as much open science as possible and as much data sharing as possible among groups that either don't collect data right now or certainly don't share it. And that includes uh, the research groups. It includes um, uh, individuals who are self-treating, uh, as well as um, the therapists that are doing either underground work or, or uh, above-ground uh, integration work that they where they're gathering incredibly valuable data but not not in a, in a way that can be shared with anybody, that can be sifted through for data, for ideas on new protocol approaches, for changing set and setting, so many things that we could be improving. And if we allow, if we leave this to individual research projects, it's going to take forever. But um, with a centralized database, maybe we can develop better protocols much more quickly. I think that's a really valuable insight there, Sanjay. And moving towards something, of course, that we see in so many different fields, the, the value that big data systems can offer when vast amounts of disparate findings are aggregated into one system and, and we can discover patterns that a single individual or research group wouldn't be able to on their own. Um, David and, and, and Julie, do you have uh, any comments to... to chip in at the stage to the issue of data transparency. Julie, uh, you first. So science is about exclusion. Exclude everything that doesn't work, end up with what does work. You can't do that without data. I feel very strongly that collaboration is the way forward, and I am always uh, encourage when I hear that other companies are willing to share data. Um, it's been, it, you know, it's like Sanjay said, it's been a very big struggle trying to get people to realize that quality of life is not something that you patent and that it should be shared and it should be enhanced in a continual process. Um, we obviously feel uh, that we will share findings. There may be an opportunity for IP, but in the interim, plan on sharing as much data as possible, especially in regards to contraindications and harmful side effects. That seems to be something that's being ignored right now, but that we believe will advance the science even more quickly toward legalization if we're, we're showing both sides of the point, so to speak. Thank you, Judy. Finding that balance, I suppose, between IP and protecting the the, the commercial value and needs of, of companies while contributing to that global network, uh, I suppose, will be a, something that will, that will be worked out in, in sorry, worked out in, in practice as we go forward. Um, David, add, over to you. 
I would say there's probably a third leg under that stool with regards to the fact this is data that's coming from the experience that even scientists, Roland and, and others at Johns Hopkins, have measured to be one of the top five mo most meaningful experiences in somebody's life. And now we're talking about how that data can feed into sort of commercial interests and political decisions. And I think there is a very important path that needs to happen here for all of the sort of infrastructural decision makers to be able to make informed decisions based on the data while also acknowledging that this is data that's coming from a deeply personal, in many cases, spiritual experience for an individual person. And so somehow we have to engender this level of trust and, and even transparency so that when a person decides to go in for a ketamine treatment for one condition or another, that they feel they are empowered to contribute their data from the protocol from the 12 or more weeks that they might go through that treatment and know that that's meaningfully impacting the science and the policies and the access, um, but not have it be something that just happens behind the curtains unbeknownst to the patient. And I think that's an important area for emerging between sort of ethical, transparent marketing practices as well as um, systems like GDPR in Europe can help give sovereignty to individuals so they can retract their data if they no longer wish to contribute it. And there's, uh, there's more to discuss on the methodological approaches, but I wanted to add that third stool, that third leg under the stool. I think that's very important, David. Thank you. Um, and leads us quite nicely into the next section, which is... Uh, a question for you on data collection practices. Um, there are, of course, fairly unique data challenges um, associated with, with clinical and other forms of research with uh, psychedelics and other plant medicines. Um, and much of the, the historical research conducted uh, in the, the, the mid of last, the last century uh, suffered from various design limitations that wouldn't necessarily be, uh, well, absolutely wouldn't be considered best practice today. Uh, so what sort of technological and methodological approaches um, should be part of best practice today and going forward? There's a macro answer to this question which involves going beyond the research facility, beyond the university, and that's by no means to downgrade the importance of university research, clinical academic research is absolutely a foundational block of all of this work. And one thing we've learned is how much valuable data can be gathered from prospective observational research, looking at how people are ingesting these um, compounds and how they're designing the experiences for themselves in what's called naturalistic conditions. So outside of the lab, when somebody is deciding of their own accord to take a psychedelic whether for clinical, uh, for, whether for uh, therapeutic use or ceremonial use, even recreational use, there's a lot of value to gather there because there's just enough of it. There's enough usage globally that, with enough data, we can sort the sort of the noise from the signal and start to understand what's working in those type of conditions. So I think there's clearly been a boom between. Johns Hopkins and Imperial College and others in that observational style of research. And with that comes the need to have an extra level of sort of informed consent so that the participants really understand what their data is being used for, how long it will be stored. Um, we have practices in our nonprofit research of completely expunging all personal records after, after the sort of analysis has been done, no longer than six months after the completion of a person's participation. So there are nuances like that that can help create that sense of safety when somebody's going to go out on a limb and document that they are, in many cases, taking in, making a choice to take an illegal drug. And we don't want that to be a deterrent any more than it has to be. I think that's um, some very good points there. Um, and raises the question of... Uh, with all these different types of data available and these different methodologies that could be used, uh, I suppose the question arises of w what is that data for? And depending on those different outcomes, different methodologies are going to be useful. Um, 
if you're bringing a drug to market, of course, then you need a very specific type of, of data collection, but all sorts of other uh, forms of evidence will help us understand safety, best practice, uh, how, how these um, how these medicines can, can sort of work on the ground level and, and continue to be optimised. Um, Julie, before we move on to your question, uh, do you have any have any thoughts on uh, the issue of, of data collection that, that David and I have just discussed? Well, and we bridged that gap um, at Aurelius. David is, is recording experience and, and increasing um, the potential for success in those experiences with practitioners, which is a huge part of higher uh, practice. They're trying to give patients control and trust, which they may not be able to get from their traditional doctor or nurse because they can't talk to them about these substances. You're allowing them to um, hear their traditional medical profiles against psychedelics that they may want to use to make sure that they're safe or if there is preparation that needs to be done. Um, as we know that the ceremony is an extremely important part and the preparation is um, amount to adoption and success and we want them to be able to have as much information as possible acquired from the community and um, the one thing that we have noticed and, and this is uh, among psychedelics, cannabis, doctors are certainly not putting these things on charts. If a patient does talk to them about them and they're not letting them know whether there are any contraindications with their current medical profile, um, from an ethical point of view we feel like that is something that they need to know. And it's something that they should have some control over, and that's the tools that we offer to give them that type of control. I think that the observations that we make and record integrate very nicely with the work that David does and the work that um, the real world data that is currently required by our FDA. I don't, I'm afraid I don't know whether the, the version of that also requires real world data, but knowing how patients go about these, whether there is a trust factor involved or whether or not there is a low adoption rate because they don't have enough information. It's really important, I feel, getting these drugs legalized at the same time. I lost you just at the end there. That was legalized and destigmatized. Again, with the both the two-sided coin, um, knowing whether or not patients trust the information that they're getting and whether it leads to a higher rate of adoption for their success in psychedelics or cannabis, something that we feel will encourage legalization um, so it, it, the data sets that we're gathering feel like integrate very nicely with a lot of the work that's been done in traditional trials and the informal type of trials and, and observations that, that they've been making as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Hopefully you're able to hear me. Yeah. Yes, yes, we, we, got, we got almost uh, virtually all of that, uh, except these two words. Um, Sanjay, uh, very, very quickly, have you any thoughts on uh, the data data collection issues that, that we've just been discussing? Um, I think privacy is going to be a big thing. Somehow, if we manage to create a centralized database, it has to be under the uh, uh, auspices or aegis of uh, some organization that's recognized as, as unbiased or nonpartisan or non-commercial. So we'll have to figure that out. Also, you know, if such a database exists, it's going to be inundated with requests for for access. Uh, there's so many potential uses for the data and developing new protocols. But um, how do we incent people to use it, especially individuals who are doing their own trip reports? I don't know. I, I'm hoping we can figure out some form of incentivization, maybe to allow people access to the database themselves or... Um, something uh, uh, monetary, uh, I'm not sure. So I'm looking forward to discussing this more with David and Julie uh, as time goes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sanjay. Um, I, I, I realize uh, this is such an interesting area of discussion that I keep neglecting the agenda to continue it. Um, I'll do so just, just once more. Uh, Julie, have you any thoughts on, on how we can manage uh, privacy or how you're approaching that in the systems that, you, that you're using? Yeah, I mean, David's absolutely right. Patients want to remain anonymous. 
Um, we have been talking with some companies about issuing security tokens, one half to the patient and one half that belongs in the database. And if that data is used, purchased, or accessed for any reason, they would have to um, either compensate the patient or they wouldn't be able to get their other half of the security token for the full patient profile. So it's one thing that we're looking at right now. That's great. So the uh, uh, those whose data contributes to these systems get directly incentivized by any application. That's, that's really good. Right. Um, so moving on to data applications, uh, a, a question for you, Judy. Some jurisdictions around the world are liberalizing the availability of various plant-based medicines uh, for both medical and non-medical uses. Um, how can we use data and technology approaches to support uh, new connections and shared data between healthcare systems uh, and consumer markets focusing on health and well-being? I think the, the first thing we should talk about, and probably the, the only thing we'll get to talk about, is probably mental health. Um, I know that I was doing some work with the houseless population in San Francisco, and there is widespread mental health. They, they're certainly not equality in access to health care in our country, and even if there is access, I wouldn't say that it's equitable access. You know, there's a significant difference in quality of life and side effects experienced by a patient when you're taking over 14,000 Prozac a year versus if you had access to 240 milligrams of MDMA and you were able to control your mental health that way. So for me, there is a significant equity issue. Um, I think the goal should always be quality of life, and I wish that our politicians would understand that whatever we need to get to better quality of life is a financial win for everyone. It is a quality of life win for patients and for, for policymakers. Um, the data that we're trying to come up with to compel that case is a lot of the community acquired protocols that are, people are already using but have not been documented. If we can show a significant uh, amount of success in end of life, quality of life, um, by using psilocybin, those those fears instead of giving someone haloperidol and and morphine, we want to demonstrate those results. If we show that, and and I will say that from you know going through four rounds of chemo, um, I would have very much liked to have known about MDMA as a treatment in the first couple rounds and not waited until the fourth round. Um, that anxiety that patients, um, the, the anxiety that patients have over a lot of treatments, I think leads to pretty poor outcomes for those treatments, whether survival is the measure of the outcome or not. And I know that data can inform those decisions. What's ironic is that physicians know this and they very often will prescribe off label and not documented on a chart, which is detrimental to what we're trying to achieve. Because if we had that, had that data, um, I think that informed consent would take on a whole different meaning for patients. So I, I do believe that the amount of connection and trust between a patient and a provider with readily available data to not, not be siloed up, that if a provider had the same data that the patient had access to, that conversation would be a very different conversation. So I'm hoping that the technology that we're all working on will, will increase that informed conversation amongst providers and will push legalization um, toward, toward the ethical results I think that it, it, should, it should be at. should be determining quality of life, not quantity of life, and I, I think that psychedelics are a huge that, as well as cannabis, I'll put that out there as well. Thank you, Judy. Um, thinking uh, uh, that's a lot of really, really interesting uh, points that you just raised, and uh, some of those issues of access um, we'll be moving on to quite quickly. Um, in regard to what it sort of looks like um, in practice to integrate data systems between uh, 
in, let's say, you know, uh, markets and in anthropological terms, the, the, the folk uh, and the lay and the professional sectors of medicine, what people are using at home and what they're you know, buying off uh, in the wellness market, for instance, and what they're getting, whether it's recorded or not from their healthcare systems. It's just a question to everyone. But between us here, we represent uh, three fairly different um, healthcare systems. In the UK, most healthcare has gone through the NHS and there are centralised data systems uh, embedded in that that form quite a nice template for uh, data collection and um, as has been mentioned before, there's, there's difficulty finding uh, the institution under whose auspices a data sharing platform like this should optimally run. Um, in North America, um, how can we find systems that uh, integrate what are, I suppose, a, a very large diversity of different healthcare providers that operate in, um, in quite different ways, I suppose, with, with other markets and sectors? Well, I think you're, you're being very optimistic in saying that they work together. I, I think David and I have probably both found that the likelihood of a physician ever putting anything on a chart about psychedelics is probably, I, I can probably think of one out of 25 physicians I've talked to that's actually ever recorded anything on a chart. Um, David's experience might be different. I think I talk to different physicians, but they're not uh, they're not the physicians that are <laughs> as regularly working with patients and then deciding to uh, sort of advise on a psychedelic protocol as an adjunct to their normal processes. More of the not all, but more of the practitioners we speak to are placing more of their emphasis on the psychedelic protocols, especially in the ketamine space or with psilocybin and ibogaine in other parts of the world. And so just a different case study, but I would agree with you 100%, Julie. It's, uh, it's not the prerogative of a doctor right now to measure a psychedelic addition to their sort of sanctioned set of options for a patient. I do think that will change, though, and I'm, I'm optimistic the timeline is, is up for debate. Yeah, I, the, I, the dilemma I, that we... Sorry, I was just, just going to say, the dilemma that we that we face in this country is not being able, we can't measure outcomes because there is no universal system to measure um, what someone is taking and whether or not it works. And that's just kind of a simple fact. Yeah. I was just going to add that even though we have a cent you know, national uh, healthcare in Canada, it's split between the provinces. So there's 10 different databases that don't share information. Frankly, even within a province, they don't share information effectively. I don't think we can rely on the government at all for government collected data uh, and government paid physicians to be entering data into, into a system that will then have compatibility with um, the systems that are put together by private companies. It's an issue that the, the, the UK is, is facing at the moment in regard to data collection, real world data collection from uh, the, the slowly but now steadily building uh, medical, can uh, medical cannabis uh, market. And there are various uh, private groups of, of different shapes and sizes that are developing registry data. Uh, and there's an ongoing question of how that gets incorporated into, say, NHS oversight. Um, you know, one area that hasn't been necessarily adopted by the mainstream medical healthcare system in Europe, in, the, in Europe, in the UK, as far as I remember, nor here or Canada, is this idea of a holistic continuum of care that involves so many more modalities than I think westernized sort of medical education covers. And that is something that I could see the psychedelic uh, community, psychedelic ecosystem shifting as a paradigm. And then if we do it well, representing benefits of that shift as a new source of inspiration for mainstream medical health care, mental health care especially. And there are areas of that that are already happening with regards to individuals being empowered to contribute their own data. So it's not all on the doctor to be logging everything and the, and the patient is basically a passenger. We've seen a shift towards quantified self, this uh, 
fairly major movement of individuals wanting to track their uh, sleep with the aura ring or track their their diet, their gut biome, their DNA. And it's becoming it's becoming a very exciting sphere with the technology and the sensors available. Not to mention digital phenotyping, which we should come back to on another conversation. And with all of that, the patient is going to be the one teaching the doctor what they should be doing. Is my premonition. And if that starts to happen alongside brand new next generation insurance providers that are are already starting to spawn specifically for psychedelic healthcare, there's a brilliant woman, Leah Mix, running a group called Enthia that is, I think, going to pave the way for a new generation of sort of healthcare payer model. And maybe she'll, she and others like her will be able to inspire the existing entrenched healthcare insurers to, to follow suit. Many thanks, David. As always, uh, as with everything that any of you say, uh, there's a temptation to, to dig further into everything. But unfortunately, being time-bound, I'm going to move swiftly on to some, some questions around community. Um, so a question for, for all of you. Um, many psychedelic communities uh, of various, various types have been marginalized or otherwise harmed by the popularization of psychedelic drugs in the past 70 or so years, from indigenous communities whose traditional use of these plants inspired and informed the global psychedelic movements today, to the users, chemists and underground therapists that have been criminalized by psychedelic drug laws. So I'd like to open up a discussion about how the booming contemporary psychedelics industry can support broader psychedelic communities, particularly those uh, who have historically been harmed or marginalized um, through corporate social responsibility commitments uh, and other approaches. Is there anyone in particular who'd, who'd like to jump in on that? Um, I'll just say that their study of ethnogenic medicine has, is, has decreased um, over the years lack of indoctrinated education amongst physicians and, um, say, clinical, clinical pharmacologists, um, the emphasis has been decreased. And I'm not sure why. I'm hoping that there is a resurgence of that and that there is focus upon why, and, and David touched on this briefly with, with genetics, but why certain formulas and why certain medicines work better for certain populations than others, because not every not every psychedelic is appropriate for a particular population, um, and there's a reason for that. Our, our DNA recognizes certain aspects, and it works better with those. Um, it goes along the set and setting as well. There are reasons in times of life to have certain ceremonies, and um, other times it's not appropriate. And I think if you look back to, to the anthropological aspects of why a certain culture does something at a certain time, there is a reason, and it's probably linked to science. We just haven't translated it yet. Um, we, this country, are remiss in understanding and linking all those very important um, factors to medicine. We just taking something out of a bottle is is medicine and, and we feel better or we don't feel better and kind of go on about our day and I think it's a much deeper connection that we're missing. I, th I think that's a really interesting point about how medicine uh, does affect different groups directly both in disease and treatment. Um, the disproportionate affection of, of negative COVID outcomes among black and minority ethnic uh, populations is, is, is an example of that. And in particular, I'm, I'm interested in exploring how, um, as this community and this industry develops, uh, how the proceeds of that and the, the benefits of that uh, also go toward the support of, of communities from which a lot of this information derives originally um, that, uh, that, that haven't done so well. Uh, so thinking, for instance, in, in Mexico, one of the oldest psychedelic cultures in the world, the Huicholes, is still having to fight with the government to stop their, their sacred uh, site and land being blown up for silver. Uh, indigenous communities in Brazil, from, from which um, a lot of the interest in, in, in ayahuasca originates, 
uh, facing all sorts of political, ongoing political issues, particularly under the current uh, administration. Uh, the Mazatec community, from whom our knowledge of psilocybin derives, uh, suffered very, very badly as a result of the popular, popularization of, of these drugs the first time. Um, and knowing that when we move into this space, we're sort of inheriting that history and, and those broader communities for whom uh, very little benefit really has seen been seen so far. Um, I'm curious to, to, to know how you guys think we can bridge that gap. Um, I, I think that if we, hmm, what we're seeing is that the commercial interests in the psychedelic space, um, these newly minted public companies, um, are all taking on various causes that that they think are going to benefit them in the court of public opinion or uh, in yielding, I don't perhaps new research approaches for treatment with psychedelics. And uh, some of them are going to seek out these indigenous communities and seek to provide funding or um, perhaps expertise, other resources. Uh, so I'm not sure what we can do to encourage that, uh, but I think raising the question, David, as you just did, is one big... ...source um, of, of, I guess, positivity for their corporations and, and as a result, for the communities themselves. Uh, many thanks, Sanjay. We're rapidly running out of time, I'm afraid. I shouldn't have indulged so many tangents earlier. Uh, David, can I uh, pass it over to you for some final thoughts on that issue? Yes. The thing is that every founder in this space with any sense of sort of compassion or um, calibration to our society knows the right things to say. And there are so many buzzwords in this space from reparation to uh, equal access and those are all extremely valid, absolutely where our attention needs to be. I'm very interested in how we can create a tangible example of sort of policies and infrastructural design in our company and our, um, our pricing model and our uh, marketing channels and that kind of thing that can help to set an example of how to convey, or to, I should say translate, some of those um, philosophical ideas into examples that will be followed by other companies as, as this industry grows. So in our team, if I may share a few things by way of an example, we have a very uh, diverse sort of representation of different communities across our team and our advisory board. We also have what's called a community or a council of guides, and that's meant to give us an ear to the different therapists, practitioners, indigenous leaders, shaman, and modern um, sort of practitioners who are leading in this space and have diverse ideas about how psychedelic medicine can be offered. And beyond that, we are designing right now with the help of North Star, which many people in the audience will know, run by Tim Chang, who's also a, uh, an advisor to us, and his team, Liana and others, I, I won't name them all, and we've learned a lot from their group about how to put in place structure in our company so that we can ad address some of these issues like scholarship programs for therapists to have access to the education they need to offer safe protocols, even if they're coming from underserved or lower income demographics and obviously offering discount or at cost uh, access to our platform when it's available for practitioners in all parts of the world. And so um, I, I, I want to come back to this conversation. I think the important thing to say is that we haven't figured it out and we are in the process of very actively figuring it out, um, working with our full team, with all of our advisors, with our investors to make sure that this is a holistic effort that can set an example. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all of the speakers. Uh, I think, as you say, David, these very complex issues take time to, uh, to resolve and, and, and require ongoing iterations of feedback you know, as much uh, ongoing input and adaptation um, as possible. Uh, and I think it's a really exciting time for psychedelic therapy. Um, it's been building away, particularly in the, in the last 20 years, uh, but really uh, in the last few months, um, 
last couple of years to, to, to a few months, there's been this enormous injection of, of public uh, support, of, of political interest. I think in the UK we're, we're re really rapidly approaching a time in which the, the way in which these drugs are scheduled for medical availability changes. Um, and uh, much more to be said than we have time for here. But thank you all very, very much for joining us. All of your contributions have been incredible. Uh, and I, I very much look forward to continuing the discussion in various ways as we go forward. Okay.